Hi everyone, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor based in the UK and welcome back to my YouTube channel and to this series on medical emergencies for med school and physician associate final exams, where I aim to sum up everything you need to know about clinical emergencies in 10 minutes and give you a really quick rundown of the essentials. As always, I have to provide the disclaimer that this video does not constitute medical advice and is for educational purposes only. And it is not a substitute for proper medical training and clinical experience. But with that out of the way, let's talk about sepsis. Now sepsis is one of the most important medical emergencies to know about and it is drilled into you beyond almost any other subject in medicine, especially at medical school. And for good reason too, it is a killer if you do not get on top of it and patients can deteriorate just like that. They can go from looking okay with pretty reasonable looking observations and clinical appearance to suddenly being extremely unwell, even in a matter of minutes. This means that all health professionals, not just doctors and physician associates, need to be vigilant for sepsis and constantly looking for its signs and symptoms. And I think the easiest way to conceptualize what sepsis is, is that sepsis is not an infection itself, by definition. Sepsis is the body's response to an infection. It triggers a massive chain reaction of different events that happen within the body that essentially result in you dropping your blood pressure and failing to oxygenate tissues. So firstly, I think it's important that we go through the definitions that we need to be aware of when thinking about sepsis, as this lets us know exactly where in the possible sequence of events we are and allows us to stratify and prioritize when it comes to decision making. So the first few things we need to talk about collectively make up what are known as the SIRS criteria, S-I-R-S. -S. And this is classically what most people will have been taught in their medical school or physician associate school studies. So firstly, what is SIRS or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome? So SIRS is any combination of two or more of the following things, which are an abnormal temperature, tachycardia, tachymia, or leukocytosis. That is a high white cell count. Now this is much more a screening step and is absolutely not definitive for sepsis, however the negative predictive value of this is quite good. If someone has two or more of these things, they may have sepsis, we don't know, but we have reason to suspect it. If they don't have two or more of these things, then the probability of them having sepsis is very low. So then our more formal definition of sepsis is this SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, which we know to be in response to a known or suspected infection. And we still need to be thinking quite broadly because this could be a bacterial infection, fungal, viral, and we need to remember that you can have a systemic inflammatory response to non-infectious causes. Think things like pancreatitis or severe burns, for example. We then move on to severe sepsis, the next step in our deterioration pathway, if you like, which you will remember. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome in response to a known or suspected infection plus signs of end organ dysfunction. The classic three to think about are a low urine output, hypotension, that is a drop in blood pressure, or a raised lactate if you were to do, say, a venous or arterial blood gas. Then the last of the four classic definitions is septic shock, and this is when physicians start to get really worried. And septic shock is hypotension, that is a drop to blood pressure that remains low and doesn't recover despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So if you've put two 500 ml bags of fluid into your septic patient and that blood pressure is refusing to come up, we would consider them shocked. And the alarm bells really need to be going off at this point. Now, depending on who you speak to, these SIRS and sepsis criteria are considered a little bit outdated. And there is an alternative system in use in some places called the SOFA score, which is typically used in ITU. Q sofa or quick sofa is sometimes used on the wards. And this is a really quick three point screening algorithm that again has similar functions to the SIRS criteria, raising or lowering your suspicion of sepsis. The first of which is a respiratory rate greater than or equal to 22 breaths per minute. The second is a systolic blood pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury or less. And then finally a new altered mental state or a dropped GCS, depending on whether you're using your AVPU or Glasgow Coma Scale scoring system. 
So now let's look at a typical exam stem for a patient with sepsis, just like you might see it in your written exams or in your OSCEs. You are the senior house officer, SHO, working in the general surgery department on a night shift. It's currently 2.30 in the morning, and one of the nurses calls you to say that his patient, Mr. Davis, has an elevated news score due to a high respiratory rate. Mr. Davis is a 62-year-old man who had a Whipple procedure two days previously for his pancreatic cancer. Now trust me, as somebody working in general surgery as a junior doctor who does a lot of night shifts, this is a very, very common and realistic scenario that you will be dealing with on the wards. And it should go without saying that a nurse has called you worried about one of their patients. You take their clinical judgment seriously and you go and assess that patient. And as with all of these scenarios, we are going to see an acutely unwell patient. So we use our A to E primary survey approach. So let's start by assessing the airway. Mr. Davis, my name is Ollie, I'm one of the doctors. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, hi uh, doc. Uh, sorry, I'm not feeling very good. So as we've come to assess the airway, Mr. Davis is able to speak to us and is maintaining his own airway, so we move on to B for breathing. When we go to assess his breathing, he has an obviously increased work of breathing. He sounds a bit breathless, has a respiratory rate of 26, oxygen saturations of 96% on air, and there is reduced air entry at both lung bases. When we move on to assess his circulation, he has a heart rate of 120 beats per minute, so he's tachycardic, has a blood pressure of 88 over 60, and a capillary refill time of four seconds, and he feels cold peripherally. We then move on to D, pupils are equal and responsive to light, GCS 15 and a temperature of 39.6 degrees Celsius. Then finally we move to E for exposure, there are no obvious skin changes to see anywhere and there is one surgical drain in situ. Mr Davis also has a urinary catheter in place following his surgery. Now obviously here we have a question stem where someone is more likely than not to develop an infection. These parameters, along with our clinical examination, suggest that our patient is more than likely septic, and thus the first thing we need to do is initiate the sepsis 6 treatment bundle. And perhaps the simplest way of remembering the components of this bundle are 3 in, 3 out. Let's start with the 3 in. The first is going to be high flow oxygen, that is 15 litres per minute oxygen via a non-rebreathe mask, aiming to keep those sats above 94% at all times. We're going to give a 500 millilitre bolus of Hartmann's solution solution over 15 minutes, adjusting for our patient's weight, and then giving a further bag if no response. Our patient still has a cannula in from theatre, but if they don't have venous access we'll need to get that quickly, and asking our nurse colleague to do that would be a good use of staff. And then lastly for the things we're putting into our patient, broad spectrum IV antibiotics that must be given within one hour. Now it's really important to know your trust guidelines for sepsis of unknown origin, as they do vary by location. The bottom line Line is you're going to need a regimen that gives you good cover against gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. A typical example first-line regimen you might see for someone with no penicillin allergy might be piperacillin tazobactam, that's tazacin vitamin T, as we all know it, 4.5 grams IV every eight hours, along with a stat dose of gentamicin at five milligrams per kilo ideal body weight. So what we're doing here is giving a beta-lactam and an aminoglycoside to give us that very broad coverage that we need. So that's our three in, now we come to our three out, the first of which is blood cultures before the antibiotics are given. Now it's obviously preferable to have this so we don't mess the results up with our antibiotics, but taking blood cultures should not delay the administration of antibiotics. The idea being that we get those cultures to the lab, they can be grown up and assessed for sensitivity, which will allow us to target our antibiotic regime for future treatment. The second thing is that we need to measure urine output very very, very accurately. Usually this is going to mean inserting a catheter, as our patient already has in. Some patients are really, really resistant to the idea of having a catheter, very understandably. So if we can't do that, measuring their urine output using something like bottles is going to be really, really important. And then the final thing we need is a lactate. Usually we're gonna get that from an arterial blood gas. And as always, it should go without saying that as you are working through this process, you should continuously be reassessing going back through your primary survey A, B, C, D, E and adjusting your treatments to suit. If you are very worried at any time and things start to go south faster than you're able to fix them, call a senior and get ITU involved early. 
ask your nursing colleagues to monitor this patient very closely at least every 30 minutes, if not more often than that, and they must include an AVPU or GCS assessment every time. And be sure to document everything that you have done and requested and ordered for this patient, but this should not delay giving the actual treatments. And the last thing to say with sepsis is always considering your source control. Could a device like an indwelling urinary catheter, a PIC line, a cannula, be the source of the infection? Could there be an abdominal collection somewhere in the peritoneal cavity if they're post-surgery? Could they have developed a hospital-acquired pneumonia from laying flat following their surgery? You need to have a really low threshold for examining any surgical wounds, ordering a chest x-ray, ordering a CT abdomen to assess for the possibility of collections building up. Get your seniors involved and seek their advice. They've seen it all before and they know what to do. So that brings us to the end of this episode on sepsis guys. I hope you found it useful. I've had a great time making it and going over the guidelines for myself. If you found it useful it would be really helpful if you could fill out the feedback form in the description below and in there you will and once you've done that you'll receive a link to a summary sheet and an Anki flashcard deck to help you revise at home and on the wards. Thanks very much guys. Be sure to check out the other videos in this series and take care. Bye for now.